That's all the yeah. Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure today to introduce uh, Catherine Zurich. Uh, Catherine got a PhD at University of Washington uh, with David B. Kaplan. Uh, then she held faculty positions at uh, Michigan and Berkeley, and now she's a professor at Caltech. And she's famous for her work in dark matter and hidden valleys. But today she's going to tell us a new direction, which is quantum gravity, signatures of quantum gravity in the infrared. Okay. So um, thanks so much for the invitation and uh, accommodating the non standard day and time. So um, I was talking with Tony about uh, what I should talk about, whether you wanted to hear about, uh, let's say, dark matter or um, these two directions that I've been working on really since about 2017 on whether realistic or conventional theories of quantum gravity could give rise to signatures in the infrared. And um, I've been sort of working with this with, um, on this with Eric Berlinde. We wrote our first couple of papers before the pandemic. And then it's uh, percolated. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a combination of these works. Uh, it's going to be kind of intermediate between a colloquium and a seminar level, because these are really new set of ideas that I want to kind of explain the physical intuition with a few of our technical results. So um, I've been working with Eric, with Tom Banks, with Sergey Gukov, uh, with a couple of students, and then also with my LIGO colleagues at Caltech about actually really turning these into gauge invariant observables, which is a famously challenging problem that took decades to resolve. Fortunately, we have more tools that are doing it. So I'm going to spend the first, you know, third to a half of the talk just trying to give you the picture about what we've been thinking about. So the reason why we don't think about uh, signatures of quantum gravity is because generically, we think about fluctuations in the space-time fabric, we expect from a naive effective field theory reasoning that these fluctuations should occur at the length scale. So the length scale associated with that is on the order of 10 to the minus 35 meters. LIGO, uh, by contrast, can reach length scales which are about 10 to the minus 20 meters, which is very small, but still not anywhere near where we expect to be able to see planetary fluctuations. And this comes from the usual EFT intuition. So if I compute the standard classical diagram, I can compute quantum corrections to it. And if I just do a Donahue esque type of expansion, that expansion is going to be in powers of G Newton. And in particular, the first order correction to this, say to the four point function, is going to be suppressed by one power of G Newton. So generically, you expect that any observables are always going to come in powers of L prime. And so therefore, uh, we expect that any observable, at least from this naive effective field theory intuition, should be analytic in the coupling constant G. So I want to uh, point out a counter uh, example, which turns out to be surprisingly good physical intuition for what we're going to find mathematically of an example where an observable is not analytic in the coupling constant. And that example is of a smoke cloud. So when you look at uh, a cloud of smoke spreading and you compute the uh, typical uncertainty in the position of an individual particle, you follow the random walk trajectory of that particle. And then you can do a simple back of the envelope estimate where the typical time between interactions is given by typical separation divided by whatever the velocity is. For our case, it's always going to be on the order of C. And then you can compute the uncertainty in the position of a particle in that uh, smoke cloud. And the thing I want to point out here is that this observable depends not only on the ultraviolet scale, which is the typical time scale for interactions, but also it accumulates. It depends on the IR scale, the observing time scale. 
So one way you can think about this intuition. Excuse me, what is T capital? T capital, what's this? The observing time. So you can, one way of thinking about that is just in terms of a random walk or written statistics. So you can approximate the simple formula that goes like the diffusion coefficient, which is the UV scale, and the IR scale, which is the observing time, capital T, and write it down in terms of the number of steps in this random walk process times uh, the typical separation time between these interactions. So the number of uh, steps in this random walk process is just going to go like the ratio of the observing time to the typical separation time between uh, an interaction. Uh, and so when you work this out, the uncertainty delta x, if you just take the square root of the left and the right hand side, just goes like the square root of the number of interactions times the UV scale, okay, the typical separation time. And this also turns out to be surprisingly good intuition for what we're going to find later on. So the reason why I want to point this out is because whenever I talk about this, someone will say, well, observables have to be analytic in the uh, coupling concept. And this is an example where the observable, okay, which is the uncertainty in the position of the particle, is not analytic in the coupling constant, which just appears in the diffusion coefficient. Okay? It has to depend on both the UV and the IR scales. Yes. Can I ask a naive question? Sure. Don't we know that things are generally not analytic in coupling constants? There's divergence of perturbation theory. Yeah. They're not in of I, I, I completely yeah. agree with yeah. you. However, I will not tell you how many times I've heard from very prominent string theorists that observables in quantum gravity have to be analytic in the coupling constant. That is the reason why I'm giving you this example. Fair enough. Okay. okay. From very, very, from people we respect, we will say observables have to be analytic in the coupling Okay, so that is the only reason why I'm bringing this up. I'm not naming these theorists. So, um, so we have this very strong intuition from effective field theory that observables need to be analytic in the coupling constant. Therefore, they can only depend on the Planck scale. However, this kind of um, very uh, hardened intuition, I think, is starting to see cracks also from the formal side from the properties of black holes. And I'm gonna spend some time talking about that. I actually personally don't really care about black holes, okay? But they're gonna be an excellent analog for the system that I am interested in, okay? So the new view that is popping up, even within uh, people working on quantum gravity from a you know, formal perspective is that infrared effects are in fact important. So I'm gonna uh, skip this next slide and give you, um, uh, an example from the more formal side, where it's known that non-locality and entanglement do play an important role in quantum gravity. And I think the consensus is forming around the notion that understanding how black holes behave, and in particular, how you extract information from black holes, depends on uh, entanglement and non-locality. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna spend quite literally three slides talking about this, and this is not the subject of my talk. So if you have any objections to the exact words that I'm gonna use, let's not get hung up on it, okay? But I do think it's important for making an analog with the system that I am in, in, interested in. So in the context of a black hole horizon, people have been interested in a long, for a long time in this question of what happens to the information that you throw into a black hole as it evaporates. How does it come out? Because it seems like there's a, um, uh, an inconsistency between locality, okay, can escape by locality because of the, the presence of the horizon, but we also know from a quantum mechanical point of view that that information shouldn't be destroyed just by unitarity. And this, this uh, tension seems to be present because of the fact that black holes have a horizon. And so as people have worked on this problem, uh, a picture has come into view that we should think about the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole, which we know scales like the area, as information. And in particular, this thermodynamic 
entropy actually counts the number of bits. You can think kind of as a picture in this way, which scales with the area divided by four times G Newton. So if the, the amount of information within the black hole horizon only scales with this area, that already tells you that um, your naive effective field theory intuition is just that. It's a little bit naive when it comes to thinking about gravity. So physics at the horizon enters front and center into understanding this black hole information problem. Some naive effective field theory or perturbative reasoning seems to break down in the way that we treat the physics at the horizon. It seems to be the case that the so-called UVIR mixing is important. I'm gonna use that in a very specific way as we um, go through that you'll see. But at the very least, it seems to indicate that the effective field theory vastly overcounts the number of degrees of freedom in the space time, which is bounded by the surface area A. And that entanglement between these degrees of freedom right at the horizon plays a very important role. So if you just take this, this kind of emerging consensus about what's happening at a black hole horizon, and you say, okay, I have an area's worth of degrees of freedom. Okay, I'm gonna call them pixels. And let's say that those pixels can fluctuate. So if I have an area's worth of degrees of freedom, they each have an energy which is associated with the size of the black hole. Now I can apply root end statistics to the black hole horizon and then compute how far the surface of the black hole horizon shifts due to fluctuations in the energy of those degrees of freedom. I can just compute that. It's a pretty simple, naive root n calculation. The answer that you get in four dimensions is that, of course, it depends not only on the UV scale, and the UV scale is what counts the number of quantum degrees of freedom that I have, but of course, it also has to depend on the infrared scale, actually for the same reason of Brownian motion. And in fact, you can compute it in any number of dimensions. Uh, if you kind of look at this paper uh, and um, think about it from the perspective that I'm going to present, it turns out that what Don Merrill calculated in 2003, if you recast it, is that the uncertainty in the position of the black hole horizon depends on the size of the black hole horizon and also the square root of the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole. And it turns out that I'm not interested in black hole horizons because even though the IR scale does enter for any kind of black hole horizon where this would be an astrophysical black hole, there's absolutely no way you can measure this fluctuation. So what I'm going to be interested in is horizons in empty space time. Horizons that are created by light sheets and experiments that we can measure that volume of space. But, but you're still going to assume some that uh, it's described holographically still? Is that the idea? So there will be, so holography and the way that it's used in terms of the nomenclature means different things. The thing I'm going to assume that is holographic is that there are degrees of freedom that uh, sit at this quote-unquote entangling surface, the horizon, and that those degrees of freedom scale with the area. So I'm going to use holography in that sense. It's kind of a weak form of holography. I think ultimately, this is something we're still working on. There will be a formulation, just a semi-classical formulation, where I can compute this effect in terms of correlation functions. I, I do think it's consistent with that. But the formulation that I'm going to have here today is going to use holography in that sense. It's kind of a sense of holography that pops up all over the place. It pops up in condensed matter physics, this notion that if entanglement between degrees of freedom on either side of the horizon is important, that ought to scale with the area. And that's what's going on here. All right, so people have within the string theory community have been interested, somewhere between interested and obsessed in black hole horizons. But of course, black hole horizons are not the only kinds of horizon. Anytime I have an experimental measurement, it defines a horizon. 
because there's a region of space time that's in causal contact and a region of space time that's not. Okay. And so the effect that we're going to be interested in is a mismeasurement effect that comes from the fact that my experiment is only going to measure a certain volume. So I'm going to use tools that look very much like what's been done in the context of black hole physics, but they are going to apply to empty regions of space time. And the horizon in that case is not going to be uh, defined by a black hole, but it's going to be defined by my measurement of sending a photon out, in this case to a far mirror, and having it come back. So there's a region of space time that I'm measuring. And then the region outside, because my experiment is not infinitely large, there's a region of space time I'm not measuring. So this effect in terms of on the strain actually vanishes to the limit that I take my arms and my, my measuring in, instrument to be infinitely large. So as my observing time goes to infinity, this effect will actually go away. Sorry, but this doesn't seem to be a general relativistic concept, right? It's just special relativity. What does it have to do with gravity? Also, so you're asking the question of whether I would see an effect of this kind in a quantum field theory. Yeah. So then you yeah. have to ask the question. I think there would be an effect. So what's important is a horizon and the fluctuation and the underlying degrees, quantum degrees of freedom associated with that horizon. Okay. okay. And then that gravitates because it's space time. So you'll see that the observable that we're interested in ultimately will be the back reaction of gravity on the quantum fluctuations of the degrees of freedom near that horizon. Okay, so it's not about the existence of horizon, but it is about fluctuations. It will be about the existence of the horizon, but perhaps you should wait and see what I'm actually going to do before you try this. Okay. All right, so let's start to uh, set this up a little bit more precisely. So I said before that an experimental measurement defines a horizon. So if I pick up one arm of the interferometer, I will have one beam splitter that has a world line that looks like this. And then one of the mirrors, far mirrors, will have a, a world line that goes like this. And then if I find a single photon, it will start from the beam splitter, go out to the far mirror, and come back. So here we're just looking at one of these arms, a signal beam, and looking at the quantum fluctuations and the time that it takes for my photon to go out and come back and measure relative to uh, a second arm. And that arm we're going to call a reference arm. So this defines now, this trajectory defines what's known as a causal diamond causal because it tells you about uh, the region of space-time that's in causal contact. So this is really important and is going to underline the rest of the talk. So are there any questions about this? Uh, it crucially depends on time of the experiment, right? It crucially, it will depend on, it will absolutely depend on how long it takes to go out and come back. Yeah, but if, say, one experiment will seem carries this experiment for a year and another one for 10 years, the horizons will be different. No, so the horizon is by, so let's say it's a LIGO. This arm length is four kilometers. Okay, so that's what defines this. Oh, okay. So the signal is uncorrelated on time scales, which are longer than a single light crossing. Okay. So the uh, if you, you were to make a measurement, let's say over years, or in the case of LIGO, they actually send out this light from the beam splitter to a far mirror and have it come back many times because it's a fabric row cavity. That will affect the power spectral density and is one of the observables. But we're going to do something simpler for the moment. So Real, this is a thought experiment for the moment. Real apparatus actually computing the integrated effect uh, will be a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to come back to that later on. I'll have a phenomenological model that is designed to mock up some of these theoretical signatures I'm going to talk about in a minute. 
If someone would study the interference of, uh, say, sound waves, uh, would you also define the horizon the same way with why the speed of sound? Or? Yeah, so I, I'm going to come and talk about a fluid gravity description of this um, a little bit later on. So uh, in the near horizon limit, it turns out that this doesn't behave like a sound mode. It behaves like a diffusion mode. But in the bulk, it behaves like a sound. So, uh, so what we're going to ask about is if my light beam goes out and come back. So that's an important point that the observing time from this perspective is the is the light crossing time. It's not the time observing time of the whole experiment. So I want to know what the quantum fluctuation is for my uh, photon to go out and come back in. And so you need to know well what is it that they're sensitive to. So to do that. What you do is you look up the characteristic, what's called the characteristic strain. That's the typical size of a fluctuation in the distance between the beam splitter and the mirror with respect to the total distance. Okay. So um, you can look this up, characteristic strain. It's a function of the frequency. So LIGO here is one of these curves here at relatively high frequency because it's actually a relatively short base baseline. At lower frequency, you have these, and even lower frequency, you can look at these PTAs that go up to stars. But if you just look at the y axis here, typical numbers here for the characteristic strain is about 10 to the minus 20. So the characteristic strain, if we're just doing a back of the envelope, goes like the length fluctuation that they can measure that accumulates from the metric perturbation integrated along this arm. So uh, as we saw in the previous plot, their typical sensitivity to that is about 10 to the minus one. So if you just put in you know, uh, a, a typical arm length, let's say of a kilometer, uh, what it works out to be for this strain of 10 to the minus 20 is the geometric mean and length length without up to order one numbers that I'm not gonna worry about for the moment. So um, this is interesting. Uh, from in part from this random walk intuition that I presented you with at the very beginning. So if there's some mechanism where I have metric fluctuations, very large metric fluctuations on very short distance scales, and furthermore, they accumulate into the infrared, similar to a random walk and similar to what seems to be suggested from black hole horizons, then they might be big enough to be observable. But note, we have this kind of funny scaling. It's not analytic in the coupling context. I don't think that this is a problem from a physics point of view, but it is disconcerting from the point of view of this UV IR decoupling that we're taught from a very young age to believe from an effective field theory. Sorry, how did you get the square root behavior again? Sorry, I missed it. I mean, you're well, saying this is just um, I, I'm just this is just numerology. Oh, oh, for now, okay. Oh, okay. okay. For now, this is just numerology. I'm just telling you, like, just to oh, hang your coat on, it's like this is not very far from what you can just numerically from what is known to be observable. So, if you had, so in other words, if you had a theory that gave you this kind of scaling, this random walk scaling, then that would be observable. That's the reason why I'm giving you this number. <laughs> Yeah, because naively I would say delta L goes like L from yeah, that's strength. that's right. So so, <laughs> so again, something. I'm just putting in yeah, yeah, yeah. from what's available. Can I ask, so can we think of this as just a dissipative system, like broadly? Eventually defined? we'll get there. There are many different ways of thinking of this. One will be a dissipative system, and we'll talk about that. Okay, but then there is a general theory, I believe, of how to uh, compute yes, things. Correct. That's systems. what we believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so one way of thinking about this then is just we're asking the question, I have this beam splitter, I have these two mirrors, they're uh, equal arms, and then I'm asking the question, what is the quantum uncertainty of this far arm with respect to the beam splitter? So that's why I drew this fat line here is just asking the question, how much am I smearing out that entangling surface? And I want to be able to compute that actually from first principles. I want to work within the framework of conventional quantum gravity. 
So in order to do that, I'm going to work a little bit um, historically. This is not the only way to compute it, but this is the first way that we computed it. And this turns out to be actually consistent with all, all the other ways I'm going to talk about computing this, including in terms of the discipline system. That we know, certainly formally in certain contexts, that there's a dictionary between black holes and at least certain types of empty causal diamonds. So I'm going to give a concrete example in a little bit of Ryutaki Nagi diamonds and ADS CFT, where this dictionary is known to hold exactly. So on the black hole side, as I said, the analog of the horizon is a horizon that's defined by null rays. The analog of the black hole temperature is just the light crossing time. The analog of the uh, black hole mass is going to be what's called a modular fluctuation. I'll define precisely, it's known exactly what that is in ADS CFT. The analog of the thermodynamic free energy is the partition function. And the analog of the entropy is now the entanglement entropy, which is actually known to be exactly the expectation value of the modular Hamiltonian. And for certain types of diamonds, this can be computed exactly and is known to be a unfortunate. So now if we take this, this dictionary, and now I'm going to apply it to flat space, made, uh, wrote a paper with Tom Banks, uh, making a case for why it should be applied to flat space. We're going to show that it just, you can just apply it to the Yutakinagi diamonds in ADS-CFT. But let's see what happens if we apply this dictionary to flat space. Yes. Sorry, this uh, dictionary normally goes from 5D to 4D. Is that that's what you're so that is that what's going to happen here as well? So uh so you can either so we'll be applying it in any number of dimensions. So we'll be able to compute this effect actually for any number of dimensions. And one of the reasons why that's important is back here I gave you the general scaling for any number of dimensions. So I'm actually going to be able to compute this and just show that this result holds in any number of dimensions. And that's actually an important check that what we're doing conceptually makes sense. So one thing I do want to say about that is if you plug in the um, entropy, so let's say in four dimensions, you only get this scaling in four dimensions. In D greater than four, you don't, you don't get an effect. And I believe I haven't shown this yet, but I believe this is related to the fact that there's no memory effect. It's known to be the case that there's no memory effect in greater than four dimensions. Uh, but sorry, I, I think maybe my question wasn't clear. I mean, the black hole description in 5D would have a 4D description. So you've mapped the 5D description to this causal diamond history. Does that have a lower dimensional description as well? Yeah, so why, So hold, hold okay. that thought until I get to the actual ADS-CFT oh, okay. example. So for the moment, I'm going to apply this dictionary in four dimensions to a four dimensional flat space time. It turns out that I can do exactly very similar calculation to a five dimensional bulk with an RS brain, put the interferometer on the brain, and I get the same answer. Okay. So it's one of the reasons why I think that it works. And it kind of, the cancellation happens in kind of a non trivial way, okay. which means makes me think that it makes sense. What does the symbol G mean in the causal diamond dictionary? Is it what, what does the symbol what? G. What, it looks like Newton's constant. Oh, yeah, that's Newton's constant. Yeah, but it's G. a flat space story. So how does Newton's constant get involved? I guess we'll hear about it. Well, this this dictionary is known to be exact in uh, for a, um, an ADS CFT. So, so this Newton is the bulk Newton constant. So for the moment, though, because I want to uh, talk about the experimental setup, I'm going to apply this for a 4D bulk theory in flat space time. So let's look at what happens in that context. So why is it that I think that this might work? Uh, so first of all, it's known that if I am only interested in a region of space time, that is covered where I cover the space time with a metric inside the causal diamond. So that's what I'm saying. So as long as we're interested in only the part of space time inside the causal diamond, 
The metric in some common space times that includes Minkowski space, that includes ADS, can be mapped to what's known as a topological black hole. So in other words, if I write the metric here in my coordinates, U and V are going to be at X plus or minus T. And then my transverse coordinates are Y. It turns out that there is a metric transformation in flat space, it's written out in this paper. In ADS, it's written out in this paper that takes this metric inside the causal diamond to a metric that looks an awfully lot like a short chill black hole, where this blackening factor in the vacuum, phi is equal to zero, and it just goes like one minus r over the size of the causal diamond L. There's a metric transformation that allows me to do this. So what we're interested in really is the metric transformations will sit in fluctuations in this Newtonian potential. And, and this coordinates T and R, what kind of trajectories we define? So they're not trivially related and they're not linearly related to, uh, to U and V. I'm going to write down the most important transformation, which relates R to actually the product of U and V. And uh, I think I'll show that in the slide after that. Where would the singularity be? It's at the horizon. F of R is equal to zero at R is equal to L, which corresponds to right on the horizon. So then what would the horizon of the black hole geometry correspond to? It corresponds to the, the horizon of the positive time. Wait, so both the horizon and the singularity are this causal diamond horizon? So the, okay, so um, we're never interested, there's never a singularity in this geometry. We're only, there's no singularity in this geometry. Just the horizon. Sorry. Just the horizon. We're only ever interested in Outside. the horizon of the figure. I don't care about this. I said before, I don't care about black holes. Singularity, not relevant here. Only thing that we're interested in is the behavior near the horizon. It's like a near horizon geometry. It's a near oh, horizon. Okay. Everything that I'm going to do formally yeah. just depends on the near horizon geometry. <laughs> That's the reason why all of this works, is because we're looking at a near horizon effect. So, incidentally, if you're going to try to probe this with anything other than a light sheet, there will be no effect. So we asked a very specific question about the behavior near a light sheet. And that's the reason why we're going to find all this. But this also, the singularity you're referring to there was just a coordinate singularity. The yeah, that's the singularity you're referring to. It's yes, a coordinate, not the space-time singularity. Space -time yeah. singularity. Yeah. You have to be yeah. careful there yeah. um, with how you treat the geometry, which is incidentally one of the reasons why we've done this calculation multiple different ways to make sure that things are checking out. Because of course, you do worry about coordinates singularities. Oh. Okay. Sorry, is there any difference between a capital R and small r? Yes, there is a difference between, yes, that's important. So R is um, X squared is, is the radius of this entangled surface, whereas capital R is going to be, I wrote it down in uh, the slide after next, or else you can look it up in this paper, is related to the product of U and V. And phi is a constant. Well, phi, uh, if when phi is a constant, this is a solution to the vacuum Einstein equation. In general, what we're going to be interested in is the fluctuations in phi, whose variance we're going to compute. It's Newton's potential. It's it's a Newton potential in this coordinate system. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Um, so what we're doing here is uh, saying that even regions of vacuum have an entropy associated with them. And uh, this is not, at least from the context of ADS-CFT, is not is something, an idea that's become established. So uh, I'm going to, in just a minute, I'm going to talk about this calculation in ADS-CFT, where, um, where uh, the... Um, the entropy is going to be associated with this boundary diamond, okay? And we're going to be able to compute it precisely. One thing I do want to say is that in any QFT 
tracing out the complement. So if you get rid of all the degrees of freedom outside of this causal diamond that we're interested in, produces a thermal density matrix of the type that you can write down precisely in ADS CFT. So in the case of the CFT with a gravitational dual, you can just run with this and calculate things exactly. And that's what I'm gonna do uh, in just a minute. But I think there's a compelling case that at least in the near horizon limit, quantum gravity behaves like a conformal field theory. And therefore all of these tools that you use within the context of ADS CFT can actually be applied here to very good approximation. And I'm working on understanding like how close to the near horizon limit do you have to be in order for all of these tools to apply exactly. Well, but so in principle, you should be able to see this effect in linearized gravity, right? And then you have just so I get asked this question, and I think the answer to that question is yes. The formulation in terms of the um the correlation function is really what you're asking. And a semi-classical gravity is a little bit tricky because you have to define a length operator. And defining a length operator in the context of quantum field theory is actually a pretty tricky outstanding question, but it's something that we're thinking about. And I think that there is a formulation, but we wanna be careful about it. So it's something we're thinking about. It. So I think I already said all of this so far, uh, but this, when you break this calculation down, there's a lot of details on all the papers that I had on the, the first slide, but it really comes down, at least in some of these calculations, to two steps. One, which is you calculate the fluctuations in the energy of the vacuum. Those energy fluctuations manifest as fluctuations in this gravitational potential, which is a Newton potential. And then you compute the back reaction of the geometry, which is really just the shift in this uh, surface due to the fact that those fluctuations gravitate. So let's do this now, uh, the way we first did this in this first paper, because I think it's conceptually pretty clean. So we take the number of holographic, and I'm gonna mean weak holographic degrees of freedom as the entropy. So S is an for G, the area of this surface is just uh, set by the radius of that surface, capital R, can be written out this way. Each degree of freedom has a temperature which is set by the size of this volume. It's just one on, goes like one on R, factor of two smaller than an ADS. And now I just make a simple random walk argument where that mass fluctuation just goes like the square root of the number of degrees of freedom times their typical energy, which is their temperature. And so um, in four dimensions, at least, you find that this mass fluctuation is actually just a Planckian mass. Now, the reason why you don't normally see this is that it fluctuates up and down on time scales, which are the light crossing time. So you have to have some instrument that's gonna be sensitive to these mass fluctuations on that time scale. So now what you do is to say, okay, this mass fluctuation should seed uh, a shift in the Newt Newtonian potential. Again, in four dimensions, it just looks like this. So when you plug that in, that Newton potential just goes like the ratio of the UV to the IR scales, which is extremely small. Now, the last step that enters into this is that this shift in this potential phi was a shift in the coordinate R. Coordinate R is not linear in U and V. It's actually quadratic in U and V. So the shift in this potential actually goes like this length fluctuation squared. So as a result, if you, if you just plug this in, what you find is that the length fluctuation scales with the geometric mean of L Planck and L. So that was one result. I uh, have taken an enormous amount of flack <laughs> feedback for the uh, pushback for this result. However, if you believe that this is a generic effect, it's physically it, and it's physical, it should be the case that I should be able to see this in multiple different descriptions. So that's what I've been thinking about the last several years. Is if I if I believe that this is an effect that appears 
in uh, um, quantum gravity, conventional quantum gravity, it ought to show up in all of these different toy models that people have studied. And so I like, you know, if you like mountains and you like climbing them, one way that, that I like to think about this is if I believe that this effect is real, or if I want to probe whether it's real, I ought to be able to have multiple different routes to this effect. I mean, we're all familiar with this as physicists. There's usually more than one way to solve the system. And so that's what we've been doing uh, collectively in a number of papers that we uh, both completed. So we've looked at this in the context of ADS-CFT, and I'll, give, I'll outline how that calculation works. Uh, we looked at this in the context of JT gravity, and I'll outline a bit how that works. Uh, we're working on a hydrodynamic description because there was a question about dissipative and whether this can just be described as a dissipative effect. The answer to that is yes. So we're working on that in the context of the fluid gravity discussion. I've also been asked, well, shouldn't you just be able to see this in semi-classical gravity? I think the answer to that is yes, but because it's not trivial to define a length operator in QFT, we're still thinking about how this is working. And uh, we also looked at this in the context of a, a near horizon conformal field theory that's due to Sola Dukin. This was a paper with Tom Banks. And that also seems to give the same type of behavior. Um, and then we're also looking at this to see if we can understand this as a memory effect. So they all seem to be giving similar type of behavior. And uh, I believe I'm already 45 minutes into this talk. So I'm not gonna be able to go into any details. I'm gonna to try to spend a little bit of time sketching for you how some of these calculations go. Can you just clarify a bit? So what is a main physical assumption behind this uh, picture, uh, if possible, without referring to holography? So is it just because you have some correlation between gravitational degrees of freedom, which are specially separated? So, um, so I think there are different ways of stating it. And in the next few slides, I'll state it differently. There are really two assumptions going on. And I'll say it again a little bit later. One is that there's a fundamental uncertainty scale. Okay, so there's something that's the analog of the Heisenberg uncertainty relations. It's the Atuf commutation relations. You'll be able to write it down. So there's a fundamental uncertainty in the UV. That's the first assumption. The second one is that that fundamental uncertainty actually mixes into the IR. It has to accumulate into the infrared. If the fluctuations don't accumulate, if they do a random walk, then you'll never see this. However, I believe based on the calculations that we've done in ads that, that 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 accumulation actually does occur. Similar to what you would expect from a dissipative theory. So this is one way of saying it. I'm going to say it multiple different times. Is in terms of a random walk. So I gave this picture at the very beginning that if I want to compute the uncertainty in the position of a particle, it depends on this UV scale, which is usually written down in terms of the diffusion coefficient. And it also depends on the uh, light crossing time, which here I wrote down as T. Just, just here, uh, you, you were saying this is an example of non-analytic behavior, right? But the diffusion coefficient is the inverse of the cross section, which is the yeah, but the observable itself square of, yeah. the, of the coupling yeah. process. So if you you take the square root, I still have a yeah. Power. I, I, the only reason why I'm saying this is there. I have I have gotten a really hard time okay. from some string theorists from the fact that this observable scales like a square root. Okay, and so I just want to point this out. But I think for many physicists, is not controversial. Okay, but it appears in a way that's that depends on you being the IR scale. I think in a very physical way, but th this is the reason why I'm emphasizing. So the analog here, uh, and this comes back to the question of what's your underlying assumption, is that I should think about this as the causal development of a region of space and time. And, and so one way of thinking about it is as a series of nested causal diamonds. And then I want to know what is the typical time scale for having a lack of for those nested causal diamonds to become statistically uncorrelated. And in four dimensions, the assumption that's going in is that that diffusion coefficient is the Planck one. 
Indeed, greater than four or D other than four, it actually scales with the entropy. We made an argument that if I go from one causal diamond to the next nested causal diamond, that then in general number of dimensions, this uncertainty scale actually goes like one on square root of S. This yeah. may be a naive question, but would, should LIGO have seen something like so this? I'm going to come back to the phenomenology in just a little okay. bit. The answer to that is if LIGO had their same measurement sensitivity at frequencies, so this signal is actually peaked at one on the light crossing time. And they power recycle. So the light beam goes back and forth many, many times. And that actually shifts their peak sensitivity to lower frequencies. At lower frequencies, you get some accumulation, but it's not linearly with the time. It goes like the square root because it's statistically uncorrelated on a light crossing time. Turns out that as a result, LIGO is not yet sensitive to the signal. So the issue is the fabric parallel cavity? Correct. Like, so like a classical signal is different because uh, it's coherent. It's it got some source with the typical frequency. And as long as you tune your uh, experiment to that frequency, you can let your light bounce back and forth as much as you want. This is an effect that knows about the size of the instrument because it follows one of these light horizons. So it so the peak frequency of the signal will actually depend on the light crossing time of the measurement measuring apparatus. So there's actually some pretty rich phenomenology that we're just starting to dig into now. I'm the, the formal tools are not quite strong enough yet to be able to compute the power spectral density and the angular correlation. So what I did is what a model builder does, which is to build a model to reproduce some of these features. And then you can just grind through now to compute gauge invariant observables. It's actually a, comp it's a subtle question that they uh, famously grappled over for a long time. But uh, here I can leverage my LIGO colleagues. And we uh, worked that out. So I'll show some results a little bit further on. But you would need something with the sensitivity of LIGO without using a fabric probe. Correct. Pro That's why we have a new. So. Yes. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Our experiment. That's why I can get my colleagues interested in it because they can. Uh, because um, well, I'll, I'll talk a bit about it. We have the beginning stages, the first stages of funding to do that development. But can I ask the question about this formula? Does it also work in G equals three? It works in any number, yes. So as a matter of fact, yes, it does. It's a bit surprising because gravity is different. <laughs> right, so I'm gonna to actually talk, it, gravity is different. And um, the paper I wrote with Sergey Gukov and my student Vincent Lee was actually did this calculation in JT gravity in two dimensions by a dimensional reduction. And the, what it is, is a breathing mode. So it's fluctuations in the dilaton mode, and you can calculate that, you get the same answer. Oh, that's in D equals two. Or D equals well, two. it's in D equals two, which we dimensionally reduced from four. So just okay. I'm gonna run out of time, but you can also take a look at the paper. Okay, so um so this is one very important intuition. Uh when I first gave these talks. People said this cannot possibly rewrite. You clearly screwed up. For example, why don't you just go and calculate it in ADS CFT? So that's what we did next. So we looked at this in the context of ADS CFT. And so um, here, the uh, analog of these mass fluctuations that um, we wrote in our first paper is precisely defined in terms of these modular fluctuations. So in ADS CFT, the modular Hamiltonian is the integral of the stress tensor along a, a boundary volume uh, um, contracted with the conformal killing vector. So you can calculate this now precisely, in particular, you can calculate the modular fluctuations. And it turns out the answer that you get is that the modular fluctuations are precisely A and 4G. Okay, there's no black hole here. This is just an empty causal diamond. And you can also show that this modular fluctuation sources uh, a fluctuation in the gravitational potential of the topological black hole. And uh, this is the precise uh, relation between the modular fluctuation, the area of the Ryutaki and surface, and this gravitational potential. 
So now that gravitational potential gives rise to a shift in the position of this Ryu Tarquinati surface. So if I send a light beam out from the boundary to a mirror sitting on the Ryu Tarquinati surface and then have it come back, I compute the shift in it due to this modular fluctuation. And it gives rise to a shift in the amount of time that it takes to go from the bottom to the top of the causal diamond, which is exactly the same result we had before. So uh, now in the context of ADS CFT, since I'm going through equivalent physical descriptions, it's known that there's a fluid gravity duality. Okay? That's very well developed in the context of ADS CFT. So in this case, what we're interested in is the near horizon behavior. So in the near horizon behavior, you can take the Einstein equation, the classical equation motion, and it turns out you can show, we were not actually the first people to show it, it appears in these papers, that the equation of motion for the UU component of the metric, let's say on the lower half of the causal diamond, just behaves uh, just respects the diffusion equation. The diffusion coefficient depends on the ADS curvature L. Okay. Now you can ask the question that's the diffusion coefficient for which observer? It corresponds to an observer that's on the boundary. Okay. It just corresponds to the temperature, the Hawking temperature. We're asking a different question here. Actually, that's a huge diffusion coefficient because that temperature is relatively low. We're asking a different question here. We want to know about what's happening to the behavior of an observer that's following along this light trajectory. That observer, if they're sitting right on the light front, is actually going to have an infinite temperature. But what we're saying is, well, let's consider an observer that now sits within a quantum uncertainty, which is the Planck length, of the horizon. And I'm going to give you a motivation for that in just a moment. I'm making an observation for the moment. So if I follow that observer that's sitting within a stretched horizon's distance of the true horizon, that observer has a diffusion coefficient, which is set by the temperature that that accelerated observer would see, okay? depending on what the position of that is. So then what is chi in this equation? Is it yeah, so chi is going to be the transverse directions. So I got u and v, and then, the, and then we're um, parameterizing the transverse directions here in terms of chi. So the other feature of this is that this is a homogeneous equation. In general, we expect that quantum effects are going to add a noise source that's just going to depend on the space time coordinates that are uh, allowed to fluctuate, which is to say it's the ones that are not glued to that membrane, that stretched horizon. And so now this equation you can solve, this is the diffusion equation. And uh, you can solve uh, for this um, advanced or Ricardo Green function, depending on whether you're on the past or the future horizon. And the uncertainty in these transverse directions actually just depends on the product of the diffusion coefficient. And here, the observing time, which is to say, is just set by the clock on either the lower or the upper part. On the upper part, it would be V instead of U. But again, you just get that DT behavior here. So the interpretation of this is now, if you think about it as an R and brain type of setup, that this, the, the brain boundary is actually getting fuzzed out a little bit. And if you compute the size of the fluctuation from this effect, it goes like two on d minus two times whatever the separation is between this accelerated observer and that light sheet, which I've just written as LP tilde. So we argue that what this LP tilde should be is just the quantum uncertainty in these light rate operators, which we showed in this paper depends on the UV and the IR scales in this way. In four dimensions, it's just the Planck length. But what I want to point out to you is that this calculation done with fluid gravity agrees with this ADS calculation. And in particular, this one on D minus two 
now has an interpretation in the fluid gravity picture as the butterfly velocity. All right, so I'm running out of time. I could say many things about this, but coming back to the earlier um, question of what is it, what's actually going on physically, and we haven't fully addressed this yet, we're thinking about this, but what's causing this diffusive behavior near the horizon? And I, and I think about this, if I'm a light ray following along, there are vacuum fluctuations, there are Planckian vacuum fluctuations, they're generating shock waves. Those shock waves in the near horizon limit are dissipative because of the presence of a horizon. And so if that effect now in those light ray operators, which is just an accumulation of these metric fluctuations is Planckian in size, then you reproduce precisely this effect. So, so these uncertainty relations and these light ray operators which are really just delta mu and delta v plus some constants. If they have an uncertainty relation, which is Planckian, then you reproduce this effect. Okay. And these are actually just the choked uncertainty relations. One other comment that I want to make, which is the subject of this paper that just came out recently, that if you start with this fundamental uncertainty relation, these light ray operators are known to be related to the stress tensor, integrated along the trajectory and along the transverse directions. The stress tensor is known to be related to the modular Hamiltonian. So you can actually relate this uh, uncertainty relation to fluctuations in the modular Hamiltonian. You just calculate it directly. And we find that putting in these uncertainty relations you can reproduce this result in ADN CFT, delta k squared is equal to k. So I believe the physical interpretation of this effect is that there's vacuum fluctuations of this Planckian size that give rise to these modular fluctuations that give rise to an accumulated uncertainty in the position of the um, horizon. All right, so let me just um, skip to a couple of words about the fact that at the end of the day, I'm interested in observation. Okay. Um, and I want to know if we can observe this. So I've argued that this is kind of on the scale of what we can observe. Um, I've argued that uh, LIGO wouldn't see it because of the fact that they have a Fabry Perot cavity and the observation that you need to have sensitivity like LIGO without the benefit of recycling, power recycling. So it's a hard measurement. Uh, so fortunately, um, LIGO experimentalists who are interested in demonstrating new technology and also probing new physics are interested in doing this. So my colleague, new colleague, brand new colleague, Lee McCuller, we just hired him at Caltech, is heading up this experiment uh, that we call DQuest, Gravity from the Quantum Entanglement of Space Time. We just received the first rounds of funding uh, this summer. So we're just starting to um, ramp up. Uh, we're doing this because it's DOE funded. We're doing this in collaboration with um, Fermilab, who is helping us with uh, some of the uh, readout and also with the SNSPD. So I just, I'm not an expert on the um, mechanism but let me just comment that what is it that's the technological advance that we're proposing to do that's going to qualitatively improve over LIGO? So you know that uh, interferometers typically work by interfering beams of light and then you do fringe measurements. So what they want to do instead, and probably I should have written out a, a, a diagram, so I'll just do it here, is that if I have my laser light, I can have a graviton that comes in and scatters off of a photon. And it will impart some momentum when it does that. And it'll kick that photon just out of the coherent state of the laser a little bit. So if you have excellent, excellent, excellent filters, now keep in mind, these are like blow torches that filters out all the photons that have not been scattered, okay? Now you can look for these scattered photons that have interacted with this vacuum fluctuation, which produces the gravitational wave. 
then you can turn an interferometer into a single photon detector. And the reason why that's an advantage is that now you've filtered out these photons. You're not dealing with root and statistics anymore in these photons. Instead, as long as you're background free, you actually integrate linearly with the time rather than with the, with the square root. Okay. So you gain. So that's the proposal of this experiment. It's, it would be a technological leap forward. And in fact, if this is demonstrated, I think eventually it will be also integrated into standard uh, interferometers like LIGO, Virgo, et cetera. So it has the, the double, uh, the science and also the technological development that will also improve gravitational wave astronomy. So now we've got an experiment. We've got to get serious about actually really doing phenomenology. And it turns out that phenomenology is hard when you're trying to grind all the way from a UV complete theory into some into the what you would actually observe in an experiment. So if you're someone like me who's been trained as a model builder, what is it that you try to do? You build a model that captures, you believe, the most important features of this theory. So this mode, uh, I call it the pixel on. It's a bosonic excitation, which is modeling this hydrodynamic mode. And you can see in the way that the theory is behaving, what it effectively is, the mode that causes the size of this entangling surface to fluctuate on a time scale, which is the light crossing time. So one way you can model that is to have a scalar field that couples to the size, to the, the spatial components only of the metric. But importantly, the density of states of this mode has to be very high to accommodate the fact that these, uh, these fluctuations are uh, accumulating into the infrared. So we set the density of states of the scalar field by the number of bits or pixels, which are in turn given by this a on 4 so you can come now go ahead and compute. I did it pretty well. Go ahead and compute now the uh, various observables. So one important observable is the angular correlations. So um, you can look at the L mode. Now these uh, obey spherical harmonics. They're angular um, weighted by a factor which is one on L squared plus L plus one. This factor actually it goes all the way back to the atomic commutation relations. He has the same angular behavior. So um, with this model, we actually precisely reproduce that behavior with an IR cutoff. And then uh, with the model, now I'm not going to uh, take my hat yet on understanding factors of two, okay? But with one of these models, you can compare against the holometer, against LIGO Virgo, with this IR cutoff, which as I said, is our best, is the best fit to what we know about the theory um, with a, a free coefficient, but I'm not gonna bet to, you know, within factors of two, is uh, consistent with this um, 40 meter instrument called the holometer, and it sits below the LIGO Virgo. So what we need to do is to improve by about a factor of four to eight over the best measurements in order to get sensitivity to the signal. So that's the goal. <clears throat> so I'm running over time. Technically, I have 10 slides left, but I'm going to go through them quickly. Also, because some of these things I've already said. So what are we testing? We're testing this fundamental uncertainty in these light ray operators, which are really just given by the uncertainty um, relations. And as the light goes from the bottom to the top of the causal diamond, it experiences multiple of these shocks. And these shocks have to accumulate into the infrared. Okay. So those are really, if I want to say it in the most simple form, I think there are multiple different ways you can describe it that will ultimately allow us to get different handles on it. But it's most basic level, that's what we're testing. So um, it was lonely for a very long time working on this. <laughs> So I was able to put together a collaboration of people who are interested, broadly speaking, in working on these subjects of observational signatures of quantum gravity. So CURIOUS stands for quantum gravity and its observational signatures. There are seven of us split between four institutions. We're supported by the Heisen Science Foundation, 
Um, so my colleague, Wen Yan Bei Chen, that we, we meet weekly to work on really on the detailed phenomenology. And then we have colleagues at Amsterdam, Eric Berlinde, and uh, Ben Freibogel, ASU, and um, UCSU. And I think perhaps the most important part of this is that we now have um, fellows working on this. So in Caltech, Temple, Hay, and um, Alex Varma Christian are the, the two people who have been working with me on this. And of course, whenever we have a community of people, it helps to make progress obviously much more, more quickly. So that's been exciting to see the, um, the efforts multiply. So I want to make a brief comment on this, uh, just a couple of slides before I conclude, is that, um, you know, at the end of the day, I believe that nature gets to decide. We'll go out, we'll test this, either we will see it or we will not. I think we're increasingly better able to state ex explicitly what are the assumptions that's going into it and under what circumstances those assumptions may or may not be true. But I also think that thinking about observational signatures has led us to ask qualitatively different questions using very well-studied tools. And I want to give an example of this. We uh, wrote a paper with my colleague, Sergei Gukov, my student, Vincent Lee, looking at this effect in the context of JT gravity. You might say, what does JT gravity have to do with this? JT gravity is a two-dimensional uh, theory. Gravity is not dynamical. How is it that you would possibly expect to see this effect? And I'll tell you explicitly. So uh, if you take Minkowski space, restrict yourself to the causal diamonds on a class of spherically symmetric metrics. So what I mean by that is you take 40 Minkowski and you say, I'm just going to integrate out the S2 because I'm not interested in the angular correlations. I'm just interested in the amplitude of the effect of electron directions. And uh, so if you do that and you just, you know, do the simplest thing, you pull out this R, rho is equal to R on L squared, what you get is ADS2 cross the S2. This ADS2 now, if you take the Einstein-Hilbert action, you integrate over the angular directions, Okay, so you're working on this class of strictly symmetric metrics, it dimensionally reduces to an action that looks like this. So you have the two-dimensional uh, Ricci scalar, you have a curvature term, and then you have the um, GHY term on the boundary. Now this uh, action, if you're formally inclined, um, looks very similar to the JT action, except for this term here which is a gradient of this uh, radial mode. The gradient of this radial mode, which is uh, in JT gravity becomes the dilaton, you can show that it's subdominant in the near horizon limit. So if you're only interested in the physics and the near horizon limit, you can take 40 Minkowski action in the near horizon limit, and it reduces to the dynamics of JT gravity. So the reason why this is nice is that this action has been studied extensively, to say the least. In fact, it's been solved. So um, that's what we did, was to take advantage of the existing literature, in particular, the solution to JT gravity in the near horizon limit that's available in this paper. Now, the geometric setup on the face of it looks different because they have two-sided ABS. When I look at that, it's an it's an advantage because what it allows me to do is to track the clock on one side of ABS and compare it to the clock on the other side of ABS, kind of like what you do with your method of um, images in electrostatic. It allows you to look at what the space-time fluctuation is on one side of the geometry with respect to the other. And in particular, JT gravity is known to reduce the 1D quantum mechanics problem. So there's a symplectic form, which depends on this Hamiltonian, which just depends on the dilaton field, and then the time difference between the left and the right boundaries. And these become now quantum mechanical quantities that can compute the uncertainty in that time. And in particular, I can compute the action in terms of these uh, um, conjugate variables. 
And so this action now uh, has an uncertainty. This, this position now has an uncertainty. And you can compute it. It depends on the expectation value of the dilaton, which in our understanding of it is just the area of that S2 that you've integrated at. So it allows you to compute, again, the uncertainty, and you reproduce the same result. All right, so let's um, uh, conclude. Thanks for your patience. So um, what we're looking for is quantum gravity in the infrared. We had this uh, you know, clue, I think, from using these analog between uh, a light sheet horizon and a, and a black hole horizon. But by now, we've been able to show that various features of this pop up uh, in many different theoretical contexts. And I, I think that this is not surprising. We have experience from this, even in QCD, for example. There's all these different types of descriptions depending on what physical effect that you're after. So I think most importantly, what we're trying to do is to actually make a measurement of this effect. And we're starting to make steps forward on this. And ultimately what we're trying to do is to find a system now where we're gonna be able to see the effects of quantum gravity in the infrared. And it seems to be the case that light sheet horizon offer to us a very particular opportunity. So thank you very much, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Catherine, for my seminar. Uh, Alexi. I have a very simple question. So in many slides, you wrote a formula for the entanglement entropy as area divided by something in Longman Newton. I thought the entanglement entropy is a well-defined observable in flat space quantum field theory without gravity. Albeit, it depends on the UV cutoff. So, yes, correct. So, why is the UV cutoff in your slides have anything to do with the Einstein, uh, sorry, the Newton constant? Rate? Yeah, and that really comes back to, um, I mean, the way that that is interpreted. Oh, that's so, bad. so, so there is a history, absolutely, uh, of um, the entanglement entropy depending on the UV cutoff. Yeah. The way that that's normally interpreted is that the UV cutoff should be the Planck scale. And in fact, you I, can do a... Really? Yeah. In condensed matter systems. Well, not in condensed matter systems, but in the context of, of quantum gravity, right, and really of space time, you expect the UV cutoff to be set by the Planck scale. And in fact, um, there's a number of literature that you know has looked at this explicitly. And in fact, this is one way you can compute this K, just by looking, computing the two-point function of T and then doing an integral, you get the same effect. And if you put the UV cutoff at the Planck scale, you actually reproduce that A on G scaling. You can't fix the coefficient, but just in the context of the CFT, you can do exactly that calculation. So it's absolutely uh, consistent. So yes, my picture of this is that you have these degrees of freedom on either side of the horizon. They're entangled, they're fluctuating, and then those fluctuations are what's integrated, which, which is integrating or accumulating into the infrared. In your experimental setup, I mean, maybe you guys haven't really thought about this yet, but what L are you thinking about using? Like, is it going to be easier to see this on shorter skills? Or longer skills? Yeah, so that's uh, right. So that's an important question because it's a combination of yes. You do the signal gets longer, but the relative signal, the strain, gets smaller. Yeah. So um, it depends on the interplay of those two things. So if you can keep your length sensitivity fixed with a longer arm, you'll benefit from the longer arm. But of course, your systematics also tend to grow as the arm length grows. So I can tell you what's being planned right now is a five meter interferometer with a dark count rate on the SNSPDs which is on the order of 10 to the minus four. And we should be able to get the signal if we can keep the dark count rate up down at 10 to the minus four with a five meter apparatus. Now to really characterize it, like to just establish it, you know, I mentioned the fact that there's these angular correlations. So you want to be able to change the orientation of the arms because the amplitude of the signal will change. So all of these things, I don't think you're going to be you might say, well, this is just noise. How is it you can possibly tell? It's noise with particular behavior. Um, so eventually you'll be able to really characterize and understand whether this is real or not. 
And this will be built at Caltech, is that right? It will be built at Caltech, yes. Okay, well then I think we've had a lot of questions. So uh, Catherine's gonna be here the rest of today. So if you have any more questions, please feel free to stop by her office and let's thank her again. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Let me introduce myself. I am Misha Shreve. Good to meet you. Good to meet you too. Yeah. Interesting. Good to be here.